We're here with Bill Wake, uh, Agile veteran of 15 plus years and a major thought leader in the space. Thanks for joining us, Bill. Thanks, Alex. Let's talk about the, the notion of acceptance and how we know software is really done. I mean, there's a sort of traditional view of acceptance testing of just sort of making sure that the stuff isn't broken or out of whack with our stories. And then there's these larger questions of how we're iterating to a valuable result. I mean, what what are the right discussions about acceptance testing as, as we go through the process of building a really great product? Yeah, so I think um, uh, there, there really are different levels going on. And uh, I think the, the kind of top one about there's, there's outcomes we're trying to achieve and how are we going to measure those and, and what our success is from the, the program as a whole versus here's a feature uh, I think it should work this way. Does it really work this way? If it does, it's good and, and so on. So, um, you know, I hope we can uh, get teams to focus on how are they going to understand if they've succeeded or not. So um, an example, we had a, a company doing some, um, I guess you'd say data brokering kind of things. They would take all kinds of information in and uh, uh, merge the ones that were related and, and uh, uh, sell the resulting package. So for them, they could measure their outcome in terms of, you know, for uh, the percentage of information available um, on this particular thing they were, the information they were doing, um, you know, what percentage of that information have we actually made available? And uh, if, if adding a new feed of information doesn't really increase that, then, you know, even though we think we want that feed, there's no reason to do it. It's gotta, it's gotta deal with the overall um, success of things. And uh, you know, sometimes that success is is pretty easy to understand. Other times, we really have to to spend some uh, uh, effort and money to to really go out and me- measure that and understand it. And uh, uh, if we don't have that understanding, we really need to get it somewhere because otherwise, we're just kind of spinning things out and, and not doing it. Um, where the more uh, function level kind of acceptance thing, uh, we can um, uh, it tends to be more self-contained, and we can we can say, you know, we're defining a feature and it's, you know, it's got these inputs and these outputs and these effects. Are they doing what we want and can we automate that and so on. And I mean, automating the functional tests or system tests, whatever you're going to call them, is, it's a pretty big job and it's a place, it's, it's one of these several places where probably interdisciplinary, collab, successful interdisciplinary collaboration is a big determinant of whether that's a good investment right. or an investment that doesn't look like it's paying. I mean, how do some of the practices that you work with teams on co- come into play there? And wh- what are some patterns you see of that whole thing coming together versus not being a very good investment? Yeah, um, it, it definitely is the case that if we're talking about like functional level tests and, and system level tests that are acceptance test for us and so on, um, uh, it can be pretty expensive to automate a lot of those. And and even worse than expensive to automate, they, they get uh, hard to change and so, um, if the system changes or the user interface changes, all of a sudden all these tests are broken, not because the system is broken, but because we just changed how we presented things. So um, there definitely is this tension of, of automating those. So um, for us, um, I work for Industrial Logic, our company, we have e-learning we produce, and the we constantly have this balance of, if you're gonna test this, you know, if we can test it at the unit level, it's gonna be far better to test it down there. If, if we uh, can't test it enough there, then we test up at, at a higher level. And uh, we know that test is gonna be probably five or 10 times as expensive to create and manage and um, almost always is five to 10 or more times slower to run. And so it's, it's an expensive test all around. And uh, um, if we're finding that one of those tests just seems to break for no reason all the time, we'll take it out and, and find ways to test some of those things at a different level because uh, you've got to pay attention to that balance. And uh, the, the counter case is teams that they've, they've invested a lot or they feel, you know, it's sort of a sunk cost kind of problem. They've invested a lot in, in terms of creating those tests and they want to preserve their investment in that. Um, but the tests may not be paying and it may be slowing them down quite a bit. And they may re- not realize that there's a lot of duplication that the tests they've made up here, if the team is really doing the unit testing and so on, a lot of that same functionality is already going to be covered. And uh, it, so they're they're creating extra tests that don't really add any extra assurance or coverage. And uh, 
uh, kind of moving away from that and realizing that there are different levels we can test through. It may not be that we have to test every aspect of the system through the web interface. Maybe there's an API layer or SOAP layer or some other kind of intermediate layer between that we can test a lot of things through that. And uh, that may be a lot cheaper than the higher level tests. So um, it's definitely classic for teams and a lot of the uh, classic user testing tools that let you kind of uh, run and play and, and just tie, you know use the system and it captures things. Uh, those often are very UI focused and, and very susceptible to breaking. So uh, having that range of tests and understanding which test fits where really helps. And are there particular patterns or practices, habits that you think help teams d delineate the, the right place to test the right thing and av avoid duplication and create focus in the right places? Yeah, and the big thing is collaboration. So uh, if I can make sure that my testers and programmers are, are collaborating on things early on, that helps a lot. And uh, so one of, one of the teams I work with, the, when the programmer sat down to work on something, they'd pull a QA person over and say, here's the kind of tests I'm gonna be writing for this thing, what do you think? And the QA person might say, that sounds great. I won't even have to create this test over here because you've done that, but you haven't considered this and this and this. Maybe, you know, maybe your test ought to cover that too. And, oh, I can cover these too easily, but I can't really do that one, can you do it? And they get the trade-off between them, um, you know, to hit that balance where if you just leave them kind of working independently or even um, the worst case I see teams where the developers work on this sprint and the testers can't test anything till the next sprint. It's much more sequential and uh, you know, it's hard to get that, that shared sense of what we're trying to do and, and get the benefit together. So um, you know, moving, moving that so that people are working together can, can really help us understand. And then periodically just paying attention to what, what's working and what's not and uh, which tests seem to break for no reason and, and all those things to understand. And wh why do you see that pattern happen where we can't test until the very end or the next cycle? Is that a, a work in, managing work in progress problem or a system construction problem? Or wh where do you think that comes from? I think mostly it tends to be a process problem. Um, at least uh, a fair bit of groups. Um, I went to one a few weeks ago actually that you know they, they had this mindset that says QA should be independent. And um, they sort of think we're acting like an independent organization, but the reality is they're not really that much independent. Um, and uh, you know, I, it, there are certainly places where a truly independent thing might might be significant, but the the kind of business systems we were looking at, I don't think the value is really there. And um, you know, a lot of times the process has been structured uh, kind of on the assumption we we say many waterfalls sometimes that um, you know people still assume they'll do some you know, specification and design and programming and testing that it'll happen more or less in that order. Um, it, it doesn't have to, you know, I can, I can get people more involved together and, uh, um, you know, let the team know that the story is done only when the development and the testing and really hopefully the deployment and everything is done with it. And, uh, um, my friend Tim Ottinger calls it play emptying, you know, that we want to get this stuff off our plate and out of our hands. So for the programmer, finish our stuff, throw it over to the tester and let them do it then, it isn't the same kind of mindset as saying, you know, we're in this together, how can we both work together to get this thing finished? Um, so it's it's certainly a shift in attitude among the development and QA organizations to, to work that way. People want to think, oh, if I wait till it's all done, it'll be faster for me. But really the influence you can have along the way is, it makes a lot more difference. I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but is, is siloed QA just pretty much a legacy notion at this point? It, it, does it, I mean, can we almost categorically say that interdisciplinary teams are perform better or are there circumstances where that's, oh, that's not true? I, I'm sure there are circumstances where you say, I really do need some, some silos and, uh, you know, maybe the like life critical things or something like that, that, that are, are that critical that we really do have to, uh, to have that there. But, um, you know, a lot of times uh, uh, the success I see comes a lot more from working together on things and avoiding the misunderstandings in the first place and, uh, you know, guiding things as they go um, seems to have a lot more benefit from what I see. Um, and, you know, I think uh, some teams, you know, they feel like, you know, our job is to put QA out of business even, um, you know, and there are a number of teams out there running with, with no real separate QA person that the 
the quality they're producing is high enough that they can they can live without that. Um, lots of other teams still have QA people, but they're working in that that shared way to make that go. Because while well, test is emerging as it's own, having kind of its own renaissance in a way with you know DevOps and automation. The idea that it should exist as a department those are I mean those are two different things. Would you agree with? With that, it's yeah. I mean, you know, if 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 I was setting up the company, I would not make separate departments like that, but put them together. Um, you know, but maybe there's some reason you would convince me that that's not quite the best way to go. But uh, you know, I I tend to prefer to see teams that really are whole teams, and uh, you know, because I want them delivering on a, a short cycle, they need to be able to work together pretty closely. Um, you know, it's not like I'm going to finish development and then give give QA. Uh, three months to test it. You know, it's like we're we're doing a feature. We're going to develop it this morning and ship it this afternoon. And if it's going to need QA testing, then we got to get that in that cycle and and get it get going as well. And that's not going to happen if I'm uh, uh, putting the QA people in a separate building and they're talking to each other once a week or something. You know, it it works much better if it's uh, in the shared team. That's some great advice on, on the practicalities of, of working on tests and creating successful teams together. Thanks, Bill. 